and this is Newsroom, Newsroom at Large in the Northwest. Over the past year, I've had the privilege of traveling some of the roads in Oregon and Washington, meeting people with interesting stories, people who might normally be considered non-newsworthy, but in this case, they have stories to tell nonetheless. And in this half hour, we'll have a chance to retell some of those stories as we take Newsroom at Large. Hey, Rebecca, Rebecca, she good Rebecca. Hey, Rebecca, Rebecca, she know that strange. Lillian Kozlowski is a woman living the life a lot of young people My disenchanted God, with society would like to live. Her home is in the hills of Clatsop County, where she and her late husband came to homestead in the early years of this century. Her companions are her milk cow, Rebecca, and a watchdog named Duke. He, he, he good dog. Hey, Duke, come out here. Now in her mid-80s, Polish-born Lillian Kozlowski lives as she has lived most of her life, without telephone, without electricity, away from the modern world. It was here she raised her family, and here she wants to stay. No, I'm not going to play. I don't know. I like here, but quiet for me and everything, and I know bother nobody, nobody bother me, and that's all. That's what I like. So she stays, mildly feeling sorry for herself. Oh, I am a poor woman. <sighs> her chief complaint, the limitations of a body growing old, hampered by the injuries of an auto accident which occurred several years ago. Inside her small house, her living room is decorated with the pictures of her family, sons and daughters, grandchildren and great-grandchildren. The pictures of, as she calls them, her good children. Pictures of young men in army uniforms from World War II, graduation gowns of countless schools, and the memories of her life. The people whose pictures hang on her wall are generally the only visitors she has. When strangers do come, she automatically calls them hoony, her version of honey and apologizes because her flower beds are not weeded and her lawn not mowed. So her days are divided between caring for her animals and caring for herself. The moment she has, she is willing to share with those who chance to come upon her place, and when it is time to go, she hesitates to let one leave, for what is left for her to watch is mainly the passing of time. But the solitude of a countryside is not the dream of everyone. For them, it is the chatter of people and the sounds of crowds, confusing to some, but to others, the sound of heaven. Okay, partner. Here we go. Oh, boy. I got a nice horsey for you. Such is the way Eddie McHugh greets his young customers. And he's been greeting them this way for years. For Eddie McHugh has the dream job of nearly every child who comes his way. He operates the old Jansen Beach merry-go-round. Operates it with a personal touch that is his alone. Grady's a nice name. Hey, Teresa, say hello to the little boy. Hey, hello, Grady. See, you didn't know you had a talking horse, did you? And what it gets him is a friend for life. Eddie is 63, dropped out of high school, ran off, joined a carnival, and lost any bashfulness he might ever have had. He turned to vaudeville, a magic act, and worked it right up until a fateful December in Portland. I signed a contract for a week for a magic act. So I stayed there 10 weeks, and they decided that my act was so rotten that they took vaudeville out of the whole city, you know, and they brought burlesque in. They brought Tempest Storm in. So that was the end of vaudeville. That's one thing I've accomplished in my life, you know. That was the early 50s, but Uncle Eddie, as he's called, is modest. He's done a bit more and over the years offered a good deal of friendship to a lot of strangers. I just love every one of them. I have never, in all the years I've been here, I have never seen one bad kid. I have seen some that uh, a lot of people would just like to pick up and shake half to death, you know, but I, I blame the parents. I actually do. And when he calls them all his kids, he means it. With his family grown, his grandchildren almost grown, he claims it's these kids who make it all fun. And fun is what he likes best. 
But in a world in which getting somewhere is usually a hassle, there are still places where the getting to and the getting from is a rather pleasant experience, like bumming a ride on the C of P Railroad. Legends of the rails, and the names ring with the music of history, the likes of Union Pacific, Burlington Northern, Chesapeake, and Ohio, names with mammoth muscle and monstrous money. But here, out in front, comes none but the city of Prineville and crack train number one, the limited heading for the Prineville Junction some 18 miles or so away. Train number two is the return trip with a different set of boxcars. Big? Well, no. The city of Prineville Railroad, created out of necessity in the early part of the century, consists of three engines, two cabooses, two ballast cars, two side dump cars, which aren't used, and 19.8 miles of track, which is. Oh, yes, and a work corps of men and women like engineer Butch Randall, a man who's been with the C of P some 37 years and can let unkind descriptions of the tiny city-owned operation roll off his back. Uh, they call it a Hooterville line. Lots of them like to work on it, though. What do you tell them? Well, that's all right. I enjoy it. No spoil sports going to ruin his enjoyment, for his hands have been at the throttle of old number one and number two since the days of steam on the Prineville line, days which really aren't all that far back. Steam, steam was a lot more interesting, I think. All the side rods are moving. Piston sliding back and forth. And all those old steam whistles. There's something about them. You just can't capture one of these decent. sound of a steam engine working got to a lot of people. The Prineville isn't the type of railroad you set your watch by. The morning and evening runs to the junction and the main line made when the crew is ready, not before. And the travel is at a leisurely but safe 16 miles an hour. Enough for a pleasant bit of reflection. <laughs> When the trip is nearly over and the engine almost back at the station, you can see why Butch Randall has stayed all these years with the C of P Railroad. But what we've found over the travels is everyone seems to be seeking a niche in life. Not that everyone finds it, mind you, but they're looking. Like a young man we found at Expo 74. I want to be able to live in a world where people smile real easy to you and uh, they don't have to worry about H-bombs uh, or pollution or, or ghettos or any of that stuff. That's what I want to live in. That's what I want for me. Joshua Bowes, wandering minstrel of the 1970s, a 25-year-old troubadour who'd rather sing for nothing than work for pay. People can, will stop and listen, and sometimes you get a crowd of maybe 30 or 40 people. Sometimes you only have a couple of people. But it's still, it's really, it's really right there. It's pure, you know. I like it that way. As long as I'm just making enough to get by doing what I'm doing, I'm, I'm happy. When we met Josh, he was singing for nothing. Only a quarter near his feet, tossed by a passerby. 
living expenses covered with a temporary warehouseman's job. He was hoping one of the Expo restaurants would hire him to entertain. Born in Louisiana, he's traveled much of his life. Dropped out of high school in Massachusetts, finished through night classes in San Francisco. Now, he calls himself a revolutionary because he's trying to see a social and environmental change. And that's what brought him to this environmental expo. If we're ever gonna see that freedom day. Uh, I've got some good friends back east, a couple of Nobel Prize winning scientists who tell me that we've got about 15 years to really get it together. If we don't get it together in 15 years, you might as well say goodbye to the whole uh, society. Do you think it'll help by driving around, singing in different towns? I think uh, by, you know, circulating some of the energy or some of the, the knowledge that we have about the environment and, and ourselves, sharing, uh, sharing thoughts is a good way to do it. It's, uh, it's, it's only verbal and you can only do so much with words, but that's a good way to do it. I, I love doing it. I, I'll be doing it the rest of my life, you know. You sure? I'm positive, yeah. And he's just as certain six months from now he'll be somewhere else. Joshua Bowes sings songs of the future and of the past, a past that is all around us if we but will look at it. There are few alive who remember those days when fishing towns like this lived along the Columbia, when they were filled with families and with laughter, not silence. Its name, Clifton. Its life, near spent. But it wasn't always so. For once it was home to numerous fishermen and their families. But that is history now. Now only a dozen men still sail from these docks. Tis a handful compared to before. At one time, the catch here was processed under a special brand with a town's name on the label, then shipped to major ports around the world. In those years, a dirt road leading down from the hills above meant prosperity with businessmen and peddlers. Now, only the curious travel the road long since paved. Mostly, it's empty, as are the railroad tracks which cut along the riverbank. The homes once housed 500 people, but that was long ago. For the years of decay and abandonment have taken their toll, and not just in people. Rotting piers and rotting timbers. And the stories of people who once lived in the houses, like the structures themselves, are sinking into the mire of memory from whence it is difficult to retrieve them. Clifton is only one river community. There are others whose names fill the sailing lists of river steamers, now it's only the names of the towns that are different. In essence, the towns themselves are the same. They are places where fish nets still hang to be retrieved during the seasons, as the few who return set about their work. What it is? An echo, perhaps, to a time gone by. A place to observe and to feel, and a place to let the past soak through, and perchance arise from the present. What brought us the most pleasure, however, was watching the success of various people. Friends, please and very proud to present the most outstanding young organist in the area, Mr. David Lee, 14 years old. So begins another evening's work. For the lab edging through the crowd is none other than Vancouver's gift to the organ bench. A slender young man who looks as if he should be heading for a junior high school algebra class instead of the spotlight. But such trivial thoughts as age disappear from the mind rather quickly as David Lee brings forth music with an air which masks his tender years. But tender years or not, he is proficient beyond belief. When I was five, I started on the organ. And I, when I was three, I started on little toy accordions and melodicas and things. A child prodigy? Well, let's just say, once he found the organ, he never forgot where it was. Practicing by the hours, he says he likes to. 
He came to the attention of the organ grinder when one of the owners heard him play at a convention. A few months later, David began his twice weekly appearances before the pizza munching crowd. Always accompanied by one or both of his parents, a requirement since beer is sold on the premises. To start with, I really had butterflies, but after a while, it got so it's just uh, natural now. That when I'm up there, I'm just kind of uh, in a daze all the time. I don't know what's going on. I kind of check the crowd out when I'm off the organ to see what kind of crowd. If it's mostly young people, I play the younger music or the, uh, well, well, yeah, the younger music and uh, kind of size up the crowd of what I'm going to play next. The problem of what to play is not one of lack of music. He claims to have 3,000 songs filed away in his memory and is adding new ones as fast as he can, trying to keep up with the requests handed to him each night. As far as the glory, admittedly, he shares the spotlight with the food, not to mention a birthday party or two. But there's still enough attention to satisfy his ego. It's pretty wild. I'm, I really like, well, it's kind of fun to have people do that. Um, there's kind of a fan club starting right at the moment. With or without the fan club, David Lee says he's going to keep on playing, probably study composition in college, and just see what happens. As for now, a twinkle in his eye indicates he's going to continue doing what he enjoys, entertaining people with his talent. I once heard someone say, if you put out food for the birds, you'll never be lonely. Well, a word of warning here, feed the birds, and you may find yourself playing host and chauffeur to a bird like this one, a pigeon who likes to be pampered. Gunnar Wickander and his wife Beth met up with this feathered character a year or so ago, offered some food, and have been playing parents to it ever since. Not only does it go for rides on their car, but also marches right into their house as if he or she owned it. Spend an afternoon with a duo or a trio, and you come away with a feeling maybe the people are the bird's pets instead of vice versa. Gunner calls the bird Pete. Beth calls it Blue, says she isn't sure the bird is male. The couple's dog, George, just puts up with the animal, which has stayed and stayed. He just stayed around us and on our shoulder, and when we opened the door and come in the house, he'd come in after us, so we knew he was a, a tame bird. What did you think about that? It must have been rather surprising. Well, it certainly was. We couldn't believe our eyes. And when we went out in the car, here he come on, sat on our car and stayed right on it till we, till we drove real fast, and then he flew off and come back home again. So it seems Pete, or Blue as you prefer, has found a home. Yeah. Beth and Gunner theorize the bird's been around humans before, because it doesn't hesitate to make friends, especially if you're willing to give it a ride on your shoulder. Just where the bird came from, they don't know, but they do say it likes to be around people. In fact, they claim when they start their car to go somewhere, the pigeon flies out of the back of the garage, over the roof, and lands on the automobile, ready to ride with them. Blue does it all right, except when we tried to film it. Then, no Blue. Parents will readily recognize the situation. But Blue finally did show up and land on the car. Beth and Gunner smiled in satisfaction and rewarded Blue or Pete with another ride around the block. People and their pets, people and their children, and a chance to look back in time a couple of dozen years and see what happened to a hero of a generation of youngsters. Twenty years ago, this was the scene weekday afternoons on Channel 6 between 4.30 and 4.45, the adventures of Mr. Moon and his puppet friends. Mr. Moon's smiling head bobbed and weaved in the focus of attention for Oregon youngsters throughout the 50s. The M on his suit stood for not just Mr. and not just Moon, but also money. Mr. Moon didn't just entertain, he sold products, from bread to coonskin caps. But the program left the air in the late 50s. And today, Mr. Moon, Ed Leahy, isn't in broadcasting. 
He sells clothes in a Raleigh Hills men's store, and few people he helps realize who he is, or at least who he was. But he remembers those times in the 50s. Every minute was uh, something new, something new happening all the time. Uh, using miniatures, trying to get uh, a moving sky effect or a rocket ship going through the sky. Some of the things we came up with were just absolutely absurd. Did you get bored with it, doing a kid's oh, show? No, you didn't have time to get bored. No way. No, you lived it, didn't you ate it uh, 24 hours a day. Leahy wasn't alone on the program. There was his wife at the time, Tony, as well as Art Morey, a radio engineer who was Rocket the Dog as well as Kitty Cat. The names evoked memories for those who saw the program and heard Leahy talk as Mr. Moon. I do a half, you know, a half decent, I think, Irish dialect. And we used to talk like this for a bit of an Irish thing, so I tried to get my voice up a little higher to do the moon show. And, uh, well, 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 and I'd clap me hands, you know, and let's have a fingernail inspection, this type of thing. Uh. In one week, Leahy's program drew artwork from more than 3,000 youngsters in 28 counties of Oregon and Washington, and over the years, the fan mail was heavy. But what Leahy remembers best were special visits to children who were sick especially one boy in Vancouver who died of leukemia. One of the things he wanted, I, I guess apparently they told the little boy that uh, he would be going to heaven or something, however they explained to him, I don't know. But one of the things he wanted was to see Mr. Moon. And uh, fortunately, Art Morey, my partner on the show, uh, we made it over to his home in time. And we took a couple of the puppets, and I put on the moon head. And I took the moon head off and talked to him as a person, and we had a good time. And those things you remember, I'll never forget. The puppets and the mementos for Leahy now represent another life. For since then, he has overcome an alcohol problem he admits he once had. He also has remarried. And the days in the glow of camera lights are memories. But memories he shares with countless grown-ups who are now in their late 20s and early 30s. But it was in Douglas County that we ran into a lady who sticks in our minds more than any other. A lady with a group of companions it is hard to forget. Eating time in the hills above Gunter, Oregon. Not for the hounds of Baskerville, mind you, but for the Bernards of B. For this St. Bernard Haven, run by 69-year-old Beatrice Knight, may be the mecca for breed owners around the country. It's home for 150 of the big dogs right now. 150 spread through kennels made out of old cabins, chicken wire runs, and trailer houses, and operated on the principle of love by Grandmother B. This is born a gift, and this is what not, and this is dignitary, this is escapade, that's Isaac, and this is la da Oh, Jennifer, you funny kids. She's been raising St. Bernard's for 25 years. She and her husband moved back here onto her father's homestead in 1938. The doctors told her she didn't have long to live. I got my first St. Bernard in 39 after my 18-year-old dog died. She was a cripple. She'd been kicked by a horse and had only three good legs. I paid 10 whole dollars for her. Since then, she has seen 104 of her dogs become champions in the show ring. And the name of her homestyle kennel, Sanctuary of the Woods, become a bit of a legend in the dog world. Not that she doesn't feel having 150 dogs around the place isn't a bit much. I didn't plan that at all. It, it kind of, uh, kind of uh, grew on me. Now I've got a tiger by the tail and I don't know how to let go. How do you quit something like this with all these dogs standing around waiting for you to do things for them? Hmm? So... They're just my kids. And that's how she treats them, like her kids, giving when praise when it's so due good. and reprimands when they're due. Celia! Hey! Celia! Get away from that fence. You're a nasty man's little dog. Now get away from there! 
Unorthodox though her operation may appear, she says it fits her style. The fancy kennels with individual runs do not necessarily produce physically and mentally healthy dogs, and hers does. It also produced two of the most famous St. Bernards ever seen, those used in the 1950s old Topper television series. A bit of casting which puts St. Bernards in the spotlight, but no money in Mrs. Knight's pockets. A situation which is still the case with all the mouths to feed. Every time I order a load of dog food, I wonder if I'm ever going to be able to pay for it. We had eight ton brought in yesterday. And the feed companies are nice. They let me pay for it, you know, along. And I don't have to pay cash for it. If it did, I, we'd all starve together. But as long as B. Knight is around, her dogs need have no fear of that. So it went throughout the year, people and their stories, wherever we traveled, we found them waiting to be discovered and told. Such is the way it is in our newsroom, when it's at large in the Pacific Northwest, 